Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, students, whenever you're watching this. This is the remote learning video that I'm going to be doing over the long run aggregate supply curve. There are going to be two videos for this back to back. The first one's going to go over the line itself, how we determined it, how we figured out that it exists, uh, where, you, where you draw it on the graph, where it can move to, things like that. And the following video will cover what's called the long run self adjustment, which is how you will most frequently see questions about this. Uh, from like a high degree of difficulty standpoint. So this first bit is just getting you to understand what the line is, how it works, why it's there, what we're doing with it, and what it means when you see it on a graph, okay? So let's get into it. So the long run aggregate supply curve, uh, when we talked about short run aggregate supply in our first aggregate supply bit of notes from last week, uh, the basic idea was that your short run aggregate supply was your current ability to produce things uh, and that changing that line change your, was representative of your ability to produce things being effective. For the long run aggregate supply group, it's important to mention that it isn't like your eventual ability to produce things. The logic behind it is kind of similar to our production possibilities curve, like the line itself, in that this line, this long aggregate supply group, is going to be a barometer of economic health and performance, namely that when we look at the LRAS curve, it represents our ideal amount of production. So let's get some notes down here. The idea is that in the long run, meaning once you stop having fixed resource prices, once the price of your resources are no longer limited and locked, uh, your production of goods and services is just going to depend on the amount of things that you have to produce the prices of them won't matter because the prices can always change. They can move up, they can move down, and you can have that movement sort of counteract the uh, ability to produce things. So it's all about just the raw number of things you have to make, which means that the price level doesn't really impact things over a long period of time. Well, let's sort of demonstrate that visually with uh, the graph. So I'm gonna use the aggregate supply curve to sort of show this in theory. The same explanation is available in the aggregate demand, aggregate supply videos from uh, ACDC Economics, as well as the College Board video series they've been doing on AP Classroom. Both of these are very good sources of information. I'm gonna tab over to my big camera thing. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. So we can mess around with my graph here. So we've got my, my aggregate supply curve. When we were talking about that curve, we mentioned that when you increased price level that led to a increase in the quantity supply because at a higher price businesses will be able to charge more for their good and make more money is the basic idea of it and part of that was also due to something called the sticky wage theory the idea that as you started producing more and more and more at this higher and higher price level because wages take a long time to adjust you're actually making a larger amount of profit the important thing with sticky wage theory, though, is that it only applies in the short run. In the long run, given enough time, people's wages will adjust. So as we go up this high price level, as our price level starts to increase and our quantity of production begins to increase, eventually people who are working in these businesses, your classic workers, your normal employees will realize, hey, man, things are getting expensive and they're going to start requesting and asking for a pay raise. They're going to start asking for more money. Well, in the long run, they're gonna, businesses are going to have to start doing this. The cost of living adjustments that we mentioned in class will start to kick in and things like that. And businesses will start to pay their workers more. That's important because when we say businesses begin to pay their workers more, that actually affects our aggregate supply curve. It changes where the line is drawn. Because when you have to pay your workers more, you won't be able to produce as much stuff. Which would cause you... to decrease aggregate supply. Where I'm moving the aggregate supply curve to the left because my price level went up, which is gonna start causing my cost of production to go up in the long run. What's happening here is we are coming back to the same X value, this same equilibrium X value. That's a super good bottom line right there. And that's how we're just gonna to start to build our long run aggregate supply curve. Because the idea is that these price level changes, when you give it enough time, will cause for our economy to sort of correct back. 
cool, we're producing more because the price level went up. Well, eventually we're gonna start paying our workers more, which is gonna cause us to produce less, thereby kind of undoing that change. So our aggregate, our long run aggregate supply curve is actually a vertical one. Because that idea of it coming back to the same spot, it's moving up, coming back, moving up, coming back, it is always coming back to a specific X value. Oh, I should have the actual visual on the screen. There it is. The long run aggregate supply curve, or as abbreviated LRAS. This is on the same graph as the other two, but I am just presently ignoring those other two lines to focus on this one. Now, the long run aggregate supply curve is drawn at a specific spot. Because it's where our economy always sorts to seem to gravitate to, that should sound familiar. If we think of the business cycle, which I can quick sketch that, if we think of the business cycle and we think of the fact that our economy has these ups and downs over time, but that there was this sort of trend line that followed through, that's our business cycle graph, remember? Well, that, oh, apologies, there is a air show happening in my uh, area right now. So if you're hearing scary things that's in my window, that is what's happening. Uh, if you look at this, we have this trend line as we go over time because we sort of follow this economic trend. Well, this is GDP, so this trend line is actually at a specific amount of GDP. And that is the natural rate of output, also referred to as potential output or full employment output. Sounds really confusing, sounds really scary, Here's what it really means. LRAS is our ideal amount of production. It is. If we're doing everything smoothly, if we're producing in a sustainable way at full employment, we will make this amount of stuff, that X value. Doesn't matter what the price level is, because in the long run, those price level changes will kind of always correct themselves back. We'll have price level go up, and then we'll decrease supply and cause it to go back to the normal spot. Doesn't really matter what price level's at but it's going to come back to this vertical spot at the natural rate of output. So it's our ideal amount of production. That's the basic idea. That when you decrease price level in the long run, that doesn't matter because we just have this amount of things. We have this ability to produce flat. Price level doesn't really change that ability to produce over a long enough period of time because we have the stuff where we don't have the stuff is the idea. So it's vertical at the natural rate of output. That is where you draw the LRAS curve. It is also referred to as potential output or full employment output. You can see those terms interchangeably and they represent the same thing as that upward sloping constant line on our business cycle represented. Again, that's ideal production given our current resources, given what we've currently got, what is the best amount for us to produce. So here's the nice thing. The LRAS curve is the way we can tell on an aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph of is this economy doing well? Because we've done shifts of that graph where we see aggregate demand going up or aggregate demand going down and that causes more or less unemployment or more or less inflation. But we haven't talked about does this economy actually want more unemployment or more inflation? What's the deal? We don't know the context and the LRAS curve gives us that context. So. The first place you can draw and the place where it is mostly drawn or at least most likely to be drawn on an AP exam is at what's called long run equilibrium. And that is through the middle of these other two lines. So this is sort of like the full version of our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. But I gotta explain what the hell's going on here because this is a really important visual to understand. S, R, A, S, and A, D is our current production capabilities, our spending and our ability to produce, and their equilibrium where these two on my, on my screen blue lines intersect is what's called short run equilibrium. If that spot, labeled as point A here, intersects the L, R, A, S, meaning all three lines kind of match up perfectly, it means your economy right now is exactly where it should be because it means your current production where these two blue lines meet is at the natural rate of output. Your economy is at full employment. If I am imagining a production possibilities curve, that, that dot on the line, that is A. If I'm, this is the same thing. If I'm imagining the business cycle, hard to tell exactly which spot it is, but it is in general. 
This is a, this is a really good looking business cycle. A would be like right there, where our current level of production meets our ideal amount of production. That's the idea for this long run equilibrium. You will not always draw the graph to look this way. LRAS can be in different positions relative to our aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves. It can be in different spots. So the first place it can be is what I just referred to. That's called long run equilibrium. And I would do a quick little sketch of that graph of where all three lines line up perfectly and that's called long run equilibrium. It means that our current level of production equals the natural rate of output, it means our economy is doing friggin' great. It is, we are producing exactly how much we should be. We are operating at full employment, which reminder, full employment is not 100% employment. It is uh, removing cyclical unemployment, it is only having structural and frictional unemployment. This is referred to as long run equilibrium, and it's the equivalent of operating on the outside edge of your production possibilities curve. Basically, your economy wants to be here. When we say that the economy is always sort of going back to that trend line, it means our economy is, that's a super loud one. Our economy is always trying to get back to a spot where all three of these lines are intersecting because that's sort of like our happy place, economically speaking. Like when you imagined our old supply and demand curve and how if you had a shortage or a surplus that over time prices would change to get us back to equilibrium, it's the same idea that over the long run, over long periods of time, your economy is going to try to get back to this positioning. But it doesn't have to be here because our economy is not always doing smoothly. In the real world, our countries are not always operating at the natural rate of output. Right now, present day is a great example. We are not at our ideal amount of production right now. COVID has crippled that. So if your current production, which is again where AD and SRAS intersect, if where that intersects is less than the natural rate of output, and again, that's an X value, that is a amount of GDP. If it is less than that, your economy is in a recession. And this is a, called a recessionary gap. That term came up with the business cycle too of when you're in the downswing of your business cycle, then you were in a recessionary gap. Yep, same idea here. Because LRAS is our ideal amount of production, so whatever this X value is, say it's like $500 billion is our ideal amount of production. This X value, where we currently are, where SRAS and AD meet, is less than that. Say it's like $400 billion. It means we have less GDP than we should have. We are below ideal. It means we would have more unemployment than we're supposed to have. We're doing poorer. We have less income, things like that. So this right here with AD and SRAS intersecting to the left of LRAS is a recession graph, which is helpful because now I can tell what this economy needs. And this economy needs an increase. It needs some stimulus. It needs either an increase in aggregate demand or an increase in SRAS to get back to where it wants to be, right? Because we want our economy to be where all three lines intersect and it's not there yet. If I wanted that to happen, I can pull up the little pen thing because I keep forgetting to pull it up before I start the first video of the day. And I realize it during the video, literally every time. Apologies to those of you that are watching this after that. Here's the pen. And it does let me draw a straight line, which is super annoying. But let's say I wanted to get our economy back to long run equilibrium by increasing aggregate demand. Okay, great. We can actually do that. We know things that can happen that can cause that. We need to increase in investment spending, an increase in consumer spending, an increase in government spending, or increase in net exports. Any of those things would get us back to where we want to be. Those aren't all easy things to have happen, but this is the motivation for things like when we enter into a recession, in the United States, our government loves to do this. They love to pass what's called a stimulus bill. The government likes to have a massive, massive trillion dollar spending bill that they put into play to try and jumpstart the economy to try and get government spending up so much that it pushes aggregate demand all the way back to that intersect. They might overshoot it. They typically undershoot it because it's super hard to just fix the economy in like one fail swoop like that. But that's the idea. That's the motivation. So it could be where you have your SRAS and AD intersect to the left of LRAS. That is a recessionary gap. It could also be, that's where the animations work like that. Apologies. That if your current production exceeds your ideal amount, if you're producing more than you should be, which can happen, you can overproduce, you can overemploy your resources, you'd be facing what's called an inflationary gap. And that would look like this, where 
our intersect of SRAS and AD is to the right of LRAS. We have a higher real GDP than we should. Our real GDP is greater than the natural rate of output. This is like the equi economic equivalent of speeding, where, yeah, you can go faster than the speed limit. It's not always good. It gets you places faster. This is going to have like a potential for larger economic growth. But it's also riskier because whenever things go wrong and you're in an inflationary gap, they hit harder. Because you're used to things going well. So whenever things go poorly, it hits you like a ton of bricks. So if your short run equilibrium is to the right of LRAS, you have an inflationary gap. Because the problem here isn't unemployment, we, right? We have our really high GDP here. Our GDP is higher than it's supposed to be. We actually have less unemployment than we're supposed to have. So like, cool. The problem here is that if you have more spending than your economy should typically have, chances are you're going to have quite a bit of inflation. That's the most logical sort of downside to it. Now, in terms of preference, most economists would prefer to be in an inflationary gap than a recessionary gap. Because if the problem is you're producing too much, all right, I mean, that's not the end of the world. You might end up having sur superfluous labor and superfluous production, but like, that isn't the end of the world. Ideally, we want to be where all lines intersect. Next would be like, inflationary gap isn't the end of the world. We can sort of deal with that. Bad is recessionary gap. So those are our three ways of thinking about it. And if those are confusing to you, I have a super helpful kind of metaphor. That is the Goldilocks and the three bears, right? Where she's trying porridge and sleeping in bed and one's too small and one's too big and one's just right. Yeah, these graphs kind of fit that same bill. Where if we are in a recession, we're making less than ideal. The economy is too small. The bed is too small. Our production is less than it's supposed to be. And because it's less, that means that our SRS and AD is to the left of the LRAS. If we're in an inflationary period, we're making way more than we should be. We're producing way more than we're supposed to be. That bed is too big. The economy is getting too large. It's not sustainable. It's not helpful. That's when, again, SRAs and ADs intersect is to the right of where it's supposed to be. And then if we're at full employment, that's we're making just as much as we're supposed to be. That is just right. That is exactly where you want to be. So that's the idea. Recession, economy is too small. Inflationary period, economy is too large or is growing too fast or is spending too much too soon. And then full employment, it's just right. Okay, so that's sort of your background. So a thing you need to be able to do, students, is on AP exam questions, typically the first part of an FRQ related to a aggregate demand supply question will tell you, like in the very top, it'll be like, hey, assume that, let's think of a name of a country, South Africa is currently in a recession. They'll just give you as like, that's a background knowledge. They'll be like, hey, draw an aggregate demand supply graph with A, D, S, R, A, S, and L, R, A, S, all labeled and everything. And then show what happens when there's an increase in government spending. That's a way to sort of imagine what's gonna happen here. So I can actually, I'll actually sort of just draw that and ignore this slide first. So the question was, hey, this economy is currently in a recession. Draw what happens on the aggregate demand supply graph if they end up increasing government spending. This is technically a fiscal policy, which we'll start talking about more uh, next week, but we can do this problem right now. So first things first, what I'm always going to draw first, no matter what is this, I always draw this. I'm not gonna label my equilibrium just yet, only because I don't know what it's in reference to yet, but I'll start off with this. The next thing is I need to know where to draw LRAS, because I can draw it through the middle, to the left, or to the right. What do I draw it? So they said, I said the, country of South Africa is in a recession, which means our current production is less than the LRAS, which would mean that my equilibrium of SRAS and AD is to the left of LRAS, which would mean that my long run aggregate supply curve is here to the right of my AD and my SRAS. So if I'm labeling my equilibrium, now I can do it where it's Y, E, and P, L, E, and I'm ever fun, I'm gonna label the LRAS's X value as Y, N for natural rate of output. It's like, there's my starting point for this. And yes, you have to label all that stuff, and yes, you have to do that online, and yes, you have to label the lines correctly because we don't know what graph you're drawing if you don't label that stuff. Apologies, but like, we don't. So the question then said, okay, what happens if the government increases their spending level to try to get the economy out of the recession? Okay, cool. Government spending goes up, what happens on our aggregate demand aggregate supply graph? Pause the video, think about it. It's from last week. What happens on our aggregate demand supply graph if the government spends more? Uh, government spending is a type of spending, which means it's an aggregate demand shift. 
more government spending means more aggregate demand. And oh, hey, wait, look at this. If the government increases aggregate demand by enough, don't know if it's gonna be by this exact amount, but like we can be hopeful. If they increase aggregate demand by enough, we could get back to long run equilibrium. Yeah, we will have a higher price level, but again, we mentioned in the long run, the price level kind of doesn't matter as much because your wages will be adjusted in the long run. Ideally, like fingers crossed on that, but ideally. So when AD goes up here, then hey, look, we'll get back to long run equilibrium. That's the idea. So they'll give you a starting point and then a shift. And the starting point matters. You have to know which of the three starting points to use. Do I start at equal long run equilibrium? Do I start in a recessionary gap? Do I start with an inflationary gap? And they'll give you the context for that. They have to, otherwise you don't know where to draw it. And they'll have you shift something. They might give you a shifter, they might do something else, which we'll talk about in the next video. But there is a third thing you need to be aware of here, which is technically speaking, the LRAS curve can move. I will spoil this for you now. This doesn't happen very often. Uh, it is very rare. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it actually happen where you draw the LRAS curve shifting. I don't think you've ever actually had you draw that on the AP exam. It can happen. Uh, I've seen that weird thing with this. So the idea is that if it changes the natural rate of output, again, our ideal amount of production, our ideal amount of production, that's what the natural rate of output is, it'll shift the LRAS because that's where it's drawn at. The X value it's drawn at is the natural rate of output. So if I told you natural rate of output was 500 billion and is now 600 billion, yeah, you move the LRAS curve to the right because you it was there, now it's there. The number changed. But what that means functionally is that you can use a lot of the things that would affect classical models, so our regular old supply curve, could in fact affect the long run aggregate supply curve. So some examples of that would be, it's so weird that it does this. I mentioned if it changes potential output, which is the natural rate of output, or our long term productivity, which would be stated by the question like, hey, long term productivity improves. Okay, well, then my LRAS goes up. Changes to capital stock, total amount of capital in a country. That's capital stock. That's a specific term that they use every t um, every now and then. If, if your country has more technology tools, machinery as a whole, then your ideal amount of production would be higher. And you can see long-term changes in things like investment spending, because that'll improve capital stock, technology, because that'll improve capital stock, and population, because if you have a larger workforce, then you should realistically have a higher ideal level of production. So. A thing to be aware of is that these things could all kind of also change your short run aggregate supply. So either they will have to phrase it a specific way or don't worry about moving the LRAS curve. So either the question will specifically ask you, hey, would this thing affect the LRAS curve? And you just have to think yes or no. And you don't really have to draw it. Or they might ask you what it looks like. And I'm gonna reference it here. So here's some practices. This is one going to practice the two skills you're learning today so so far. Those two skills are knowing how to draw the aggregate demand supply graph with LRAS represented. And the next part is how to draw an LRAS shift. And the shift will just be a right or a leftward shift of the vertical line. So just like moving other lines, you're just moving it to the right or the left. So don't get too caught up in like, what do I do? Just take the vertical line. If you think our ideal amount of production increases, move it to the right. If you think it decreases, move it to the left. So for one, two, and three, draw the graphs. Make sure you know where you're drawing LRAS first and then draw the shift based on the question. So for the first one, it says, and feel free to pause and work through it. So for the first one, it says draw an aggregate demand and aggregate supply graph of an economy currently at full employment. Okay. Means the economy is doing well. Love to see that. Love to hear it. So it's an economy that is doing pretty well so far. So when I'm drawing this, I'm drawing, again, the SRAS and AD lines first, because I always draw those, because this, this part always exists. The part that is a variable is where LRAS is. I'm at full employment, which means our economy is crushing it, which means I will draw that LRAS line right through the middle, intersecting the SRAS and the AD line. I'm going to label that Y, E, and P, L, E as my starting points. This is how the graph would start. This is how you would begin question one. What will happen to LRAS if there is an increase in potential output? Remember that potential output is like the literal X value that you draw LRAS at. They're saying that number is now higher. Okay. 
That's not a problem for me. If that number's higher, then LRS is bigger. So I'll move the vertical line. over to the right, like that. And this is kind of why you don't see it happen a lot because that drawing feels kind of weird. Namely because I don't use that LRAS line for new equilibrium points because they're not real equilibrium points. Like SRAS and LRAS's intersect doesn't mean anything. LRAS and AD's intersect doesn't mean anything because those other two lines are happening like in the short run. So I don't really need to worry about them. This is why you don't typically see it drawn. So if you're gonna ask, answer that question verbally, you would just say the LRAS curve would shift rightward as potential output increases because the ideal amount of production is now higher. So that's what it would look like. You just don't typically end up drawing these on the AP exam because they look really weird. They just don't look great on a graph. For question two, it says draw an economy that's currently facing an inflationary gap and then what'll happen to LRAS if there's a decrease in the amount of capital stock in that economy. Okay, I'm just gonna do my quick little sketch of the graph again. I'm gonna abbreviate my axes this time to save myself a little bit of time on this. Now it says that I'm facing an inflationary gap. So I gotta remember where I'm gonna put my LRAS curve and if I'm in an inflationary gap, that means that I am producing more than what I'm supposed to be producing. We're currently producing more than we're supposed to. This is what will happen to the LRS if there's a decrease in the amount of capital stock. Well, that makes our ideal production even less. So I would take that LRS curve and I would shift it even further to the left. This is making a problem even worse, basically. And again, looks kind of weird. I don't love how that looks. And that's partially because you don't ever really see this drawn. So I take that LRS curve and I shift it more to the left because my ideal production is lower. And the third one is we are in a recession. It's a recessionary gap. What happens if there's an increase in birth rate? An increase in birth rate or like a reduction in infant mortality rate. These are like your long-term population change type of scenarios where like that's a thing that doesn't really help us produce more right now, but it will help us produce more in the future. So again, this economy is in a recession, so my graph should look like this. So our current production lagging behind the LRAS curve. If we have an increase in birth rate, then our ideal amount of production long term will be quite a bit higher. Our ideal amount of production will be a little bit larger because we have a larger workforce, things like that. So we'll shift over a that away. So again, the disclaimer here is that you don't really end up drawing these LRAS shifts. You do use LRAS and that starting point is critical. Like the first half of these questions, being able to draw an economy at full employment, recessionary gap, and inflationary gap, you need to be able to do that. So make sure that you're getting that part down because that part, it does take a while to get the hang of it. The best way to do it is to think about it when you're doing it of like, okay, where SRAS and AD is where my economy is currently at. If I'm in a recession, that means my economy is doing poorly, so I should be behind LRAS, which is to the left of it, because it's an X value thing. So I'm doing worse than my LRAS, that would mean that my equilibrium is to the left of it. If I'm doing better than my LRAS, that's an inflationary gap, we're doing too much, so we'd be ahead of it or to the right. It's the kind of idea there. Okay. I think that's actually it for the first half, this first video. So that video, the big points are, make sure you know what the LRAS curve is, what it represents. Again, ideal production, natural rate of output, full employment output, full employment, those kinds of things. It's like your PPC point on the line, okay? The second big thing, know where to draw it in reference to your aggregate demand and aggregate supply curves. And again, that will actually vary depending on the economic situation that you are drawing. If you're drawing an economy at full employment, right to the middle, in the economy in recession, your LRAS curve is to the left, no, sorry, to the right of your aggregate demand supply curve and your, of your short run equilibrium. And if you're in an inflationary gap, then your LRAS is to the left of your short run equilibrium. Those things are critical. 
Lastly, be aware of some vocab terms and things that can actually cause the LRAS curve to shift. You won't really have to draw it, but they might ask, hey, what happens to LRAS here? And your previous answer was that capital stock for some reason in this country increased. We'll get into reasons why that can happen later. They're like, hey, capital stock increase is cool. The follow-up question is then, what happens to LRAS? And you're like, well, capital stock is going up, so our ideal amount of production will be higher. So LRAS would increase, shift rightward. You don't usually draw because it, it looks weird to draw it, but they might ask you to verbalize it. That does happen. Okay, so that is the end of this first LRAS video. For some of you guys that are watching after, and are like, wait, do you do those weird problems? Those are the long-run self-adjustment problems, and that is the next video. So please watch that video if you're trying to figure out what happens when a question asks what will happen in the long run. Because that's a long-run self-adjustment problem. All right, that is it for this first video. Thank you guys very much. Wish you all the best.